Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening to all of you in Europe, and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. I am Saber Khan from the College of Design at Georgia Tech, where I have a joint appointment in both the School of Industrial Design and the School of Architecture. The event today is part of France Atlanta 2021. France Atlanta was created by the Consulate General of France in Atlanta and Georgia Tech in 2010. It is an annual event series centered on innovation and designed to foster cooperation between France and the U.S. Southeast. This year's edition is made possible in part through the support of the Honey Bee Foundation, the Raymond Skinazzi and Family Foundation, Air France, TV5 Monde, Jade Fiducial, and the French American Chamber of Commerce in Atlanta. Our event today, this afternoon, is supported by the Consulate of France in Atlanta and the Marketing and Communications team at the College of Design. I would like to thank Zoe Kafkas, who has been just super with the idiosyncrasies of Blue Jeans events and is on board with us right now. I, for one, cannot wait when, finally, in spring 22, Georgia Tech joins the rest of the world in using Zoom. Before we begin, I would also like to thank David Ruffel. David is the new cultural attaché of the Consulate of France in Atlanta and head of the Atlanta Office of Cultural Services, the French Embassy in the United States. Before coming to Atlanta in September, he was the attaché for books and ideas at the French Embassy in Cairo. Take a moment to savor that, attaché of books and ideas. D David is also the director of the Villa Albertine in Atlanta, Reinventing Artists' Residencies, Villa Albertine is creating a network of arts and ideas spanning France and the United States. It offers tailor-made residencies for global creators, thinkers, and cultural professionals. Villa Albertine in Atlanta will hold five residencies until the end of 2022 in the fields of cinema, music, visual art, video games, and literature. It is currently hosting its first resident, writer and researcher Mabula Dumahuro. Villa Albertine in Atlanta also programs events all year long and is currently launching a new program dedicated to urban issues called City Cité. I encourage you to follow them. I especially look forward to collaborating with David on many exciting events over the next three years. Now to our program this afternoon that looks at material reuse and the building material cycle through which, through the lens of three different practices. Bella Stock, founded in Paris in 2006, Rotor in Brussels also in 2006, and Rural Studio, founded in, founded in New Bern, Alabama in 1993, provide a fascinating window into the many logistical, technical, economic, formal and social challenges involved in reusing building materials and building components. Their work offers lessons and inspiration to all of us, to students, to building industry professionals, to artists and architects and activists, and above all, to engaged citizens. The three collaborative practices, Rotor, Bellastock, and Rural Studio, share an ethos but their origins, context, scales, and the material and social worlds in which they operate give each a particular and compelling profile. During this short session, my hope is that we learn from them and about the reuse of materials from all of these three practices and lead with our sense of what is possible expanded. Each panelist will introduce one of the three practices. We will follow that with a conversation between the four of us. And at the end, with a few, and we'll end with a few questions from all of you attending. Please be sure to post them to the questions, not to the chat. Though of course, you can chatter away in the background to your pleasure. Now I'd like to introduce the three panelists in the order that they will present. Antoine Aubinet is an architect. He graduated from the Ecole d'Architecture de Paris-Belleville in 2010 
While still a student there, he co-founded Bellastock in 2006 and was the association's president until 2012. He is now co-managing director of SCIC Bellastock. Its present status as a quote, cooperative society of collective interest. In 2018, Antoine founded the Center for Art, Architecture and Landscape Heritage at the request of the French Ministry of Culture. Emmanuel Cortez is an urban planner from Chicago, working with Rotor since 2017. Having worked at Rotor DC in logistics, inventory and business development, he has three years experience in the reuse of materials and in circular construction. He's currently working in communications for the FCRBE project at Rotor. FCRBE stands for facilitating the circulation of reclaimed building elements in Northwestern Europe. And finally, Rusty Smith is the Associate Director of Rural Studio, Auburn University's internationally recognized design-built architecture program that gives students a hands-on educational experience while assisting the underserved communities of Alabama's rural black, well, that black belt region. Rusty has an MFA in studio from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a Bachelor of Interior Design from Auburn University. He has received National Teaching Honor Awards from both the AIA as well as AIAS. If we were in person, I would say, let's give them all a warm hand. Um, but we get started now. Uh, we have a healthy 62 attendees out of a registration list of um, 110, so that's not bad. Um, Antoine, we're going to turn it over to you and um, let's get started. Thanks. Thanks, Sabir, for the introduction and for the inv invitation. I'm really proud to be close to Rural and Rotor. So um, I check my sharing up. Computer, I select the screen up and it's okay normally. So, okay. I, yeah, thanks. I decide to introduce first a bit of the history of Belastock to explain you that we began really early uh, during our study to develop a kind of festival because we wanted to to practice more, uh, to be on the field, to be to build by ourselves. And we just developed a simple exercise. It was uh, the conception to build uh, our own shelter, to live in during four days and to deconstruct it. And finally, in that exercise, we had all the elements we use now, Belastock, to de develop our own project. I mean, uh, just taking care of the material and uh, assemble, it easily to disassemble it at, at the same time a social um, moment because it, it was 100 participants at the first one and how to deconstruct so we already know that the things we build had to be uh, deconstructed after so you you have in mind this sort of of uh, a strategy the festival grow a lot and we invite more and more students there were uh, uh, lots of architecture students who wanted to practice. And so we start to be 1,000 participants. So that's the inflate city we did. And it began to be an open air school where people uh, at the beginning was invited for um, lectures with specialists and then arriving on the field to test by themselves. But at the same time, the festival was growing. We had this question of, uh, how to use that material and how to um, to know we, we didn't want to create some waste so we say let's speak about uh, diverting my material and let's speak about reuse element so we did uh, this um, this festival called uh, the the great diverting and we collect lots of waste around around paris to give it to the participants so they were like uh, some wood waste, some textile, but um, as we 
to invite the students on, on, on the festival, we had to build the lights, the kitchen, the toilet, all the elements we need for uh, to live with this 1,000 people. And so we built our first land down with elements from a deconstruction close to the festival. There were a huge um, factory where we collect the fire tube network, calling Sprinkler, and the, um, the element from the roof to make that light. And it was our first um, moment that we uh, deconstruct a building to make uh, a, a new element. And you will see that it starts a project, a club that I will present you after. Then we continue with the same um, philosophy, like the water, the floating city. As you can see, I wanted to show you this image, this photo, because all the wood is assembled with a rope and we didn't uh, screw it or cut it because all the wood you, you see on that, on that photo, we already um, find a way to reuse it in a, in a future uh, project. So the philosophy of reusing was um, more um, uh, coming through our festival. But the question was, can we, can we have a an intelligent territory impact with that process of reuse elements? So in 2016, we decided to work about a huge urbanism project close to Paris in the north. And as you can see, there is um, a really old um, factory that they want to transform um, as a residential area. And there is new public space and new park. And the question was how to collect the material from uh, this territory and how to influence the future urban sketch uh, done with the, the work with the inhabitants. So we start to, to make installation for um, six months done with reuse elements. And as you can see, we test uh, some, some new project like um, um, football step down with telephonic pillar. And that, that's the moment we start to think um, how to work with the inhabitant and how to link the fact of reusing element as a, a strategy to, to, to make link in a district and with people. I will explain you more after, but it's just to, to show how it starts in 2016. Uh, in 17, uh, they, they, they were a huge project um, about how to reuse all the earth from uh, the extracting project of the Grand Paris. And we decide to work with the laboratory in, in Grenoble, Crater, to uh, reuse the earth to make some compressed blocks. So we did um, 17,000 blocks for the festival for the participants. And the participants play with that uh, blocks. Of course, we collect it. I just wanted to show you uh, the plan and the map of the ephemeral city we did with 500 participants. The first day they make the, the wall for the night. The second day you can see that it appears some distribution um, place in, in the city. And uh, then, of course, the last day you have the print of the 500 participants. Of course, we collect all the, the block to, to reuse it in, in a new project in the north of, of Paris. But it was also a, a way to, to speak about reuse with the, the student. The project I was uh, explaining you before, um, close to the, the festival of a reuse material, it's, it's, it, um, the festival start a laboratory we, we did uh, calling ACLAB. I will explain um, how, how it starts. So we did the festival close to the, that uh, industry factory. We collect the elements uh, in that building. Is They build it in 65 and they demolish it in uh, 2013. Of course, the, the, the building was, was okay. They just wanted to transform this industry place in a, in a residential area. Um, Unfortunately, we wanted to keep the building, uh, but they prefer to completely use and demolish it. So we say, uh, please, can we try to make um, reuse from that material and to introduce that material in the new uh, 
uh, residential area they want to build. So the question for Belastok was the author of material, because it was 40,000 meters squares uh, of uh, mat mat matter, to, um, and to get this material to introduce it in the, in the new project. So the first step we had was to make a diagnostic of the, the different elements you can find in, um, in that factory. So, for example, the concrete beam, and we did a kind of, um, uh, not a map, but something explaining how to collect uh, and how we can use it in a new project. Then we follow the, the demolition of the, of the factory, and we see that the beam, when they, they crash it, we can use it as, as a stone to make the different um, way in the, in, the, in the future garden. So we continue to make different prototypes done with the element from the factory. And for example, the pillar, we use it as a, as a landscape step uh, in the new project. And we just make a lot, lots of uh, stride on that place. It was the first laboratory we, we did in from 2000, 2012 until last year that we, we stopped the, the project. So with that, uh, culture of, um, of, yeah, it was the, the first time we, we had um, this kind of uh, process. And then uh, from that project, ACLAB, we start to get more and more uh, demand. Uh, so, for example, I wanted to show an, another project. It will, it will explain how we, we worked with the material. We always uh, think about scenography and strategy to, also um, explain to, to the inhabitant uh, how we uh, recuperate the, the material. So it's in Nantes, in the west of France. It's a military caserne, and uh, we make a diagnostic from the building, and we saw that there were a lot of interesting stone in the different um, buildings. So we, we start to collect. And as you can see, we did a kind of scenography showing um, the, um, the different type of stone we recuperate. We use the sand uh, to, to, to protect uh, the different stone. And then we start to explain to the inhabitant the process and how we're going to use that element. So we, of course, invite the new, the future habitant of the building to, to make some visit and explaining um, the different uh, stone that we're going to use. Then uh, we bought some tennis referee uh, chair uh, to just bring the the spectat the the future inhabitant uh, and at an high point to see all the stone we recuperate and explaining them uh, that that for example we use the the stones from the stairs and it will be the new block to park some bike in the future project like. Uh, it's a way for us to explain um, and to to help um, people to understand how uh, the, the the reuse can can work in the future project. We we, we did some prototype down in in the district directly, um, so it's really easy for for them to understand. And the last project I wanted to explain you because for me it's even a, a step. Uh, further is La Fabrique du Clos. Uh, so we are in um, in the north of Paris. And why I wanted to finish with this one is that we employed uh, people uh, through this strategy of reusing material. So I, I explain it. It's a district uh, built in the in the 70s. So it's calling Le Clos Saint Lazare. It's in the north of Paris, and they want to make uh, urban renovation. And they want to demolish some blocks and introduce new public spaces. And sometimes the, the problem of, of that type of process is that they demolish some blocks, but it doesn't create any, um, any development for the people who live there. So the, the work for Belastok was to, to understand how to keep the material from the demolition, to, make new public spaces, but how, how to employ uh, people from that district 
to help us to um, um, collect, to divert the, the mat material and to uh, transform it. So the first step for Bellastock, like always, it's to analyze the, the different archive and see the, the historical photo to understand how they build it uh, in that moment, in the 70s, because like deconstruct is uh, constructing in the other way. And you can have all the, the response for the construction in the, the different um, engineering archive of the building. After that, we follow the different um, company who, who demolish. We work closely with them to understand and to find process to collect uh, the different elements from, from the, the building. And uh, also like understanding which type uh, of of element we will find through the um, conventional demolishing process. Um, after that, after analyzing the potential of, of the, the building, we decide to develop a place directly in the district. So it, it was the a place where uh, they, they had a tower first. And we asked to get a logistic uh, place, a place for uh, the stock, a place to make the prototype and a place for um, the different inhabitants. And the game for us is to to make um, a place really, um, how, how can I explain? It's not a place where you can see only six prototypes. We did a garden and all the prototypes are integrated in the garden. So when we invite people from outside during summer, they can directly use the, the different prototype with us. So, for example, the stone from the, the construction, we use it as a dry, uh, dry, uh, dry stone assemble. I hope it's the good word. I'm not sure. And we test lots of different type of uh, floor and uh, garden, garden landscape uh, work. And that's the moment we invite some um, some workers who there are people who work with stone, and they. Um, they make a formation, they learn to people from the district how to use that stone. So we employed three people from Clos Saint Lazare and uh, the, the, the worker from Bellastock learn how to, to, uh, to divert and to transform the, the matter. Um, some photos of the place because we also invite a gardener to make a, a garden during the, the summer. We also used like huge, like an entire wall to make um, and to keep, to get it, to clean it with a, a, an enterprise from the, the district to make a place for the future um, bicycle uh, bicycle park. And we use we use the, the concrete in different in different way just to make a, a prototype and to finish. As I was explaining you during summer, we give uh, the key to an association. So we help uh, some inhabitants from the district to make an association and to use the place during the whole summer. And we transform the place uh, with uh, some food, concert, a game for children. Every Friday we explain architecture we're using to all the children from the district. And it's a way for us uh, in Bellastock to to use the the idea of the uh, material cir circulation in, in a place like a way to develop economically and culturally uh, the people who live there and that's my conclusion thanks everybody I will be happy to answer thank you Antoine I I'm breaking convention here you guys were supposed to move from one to the other but um, before Emmanuel comes on, that was fantastic. The way it covered all the scales and, 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 and everything from 2006, the beginning of a student project to taking on entire districts in 93, the north of Paris. Um, Emmanuel? Yes, I'm here. Um, I will start sharing my screen in a second.
All right, so you should be seeing my presentation now. I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sabi, for the introduction and Antoine for this great presentation on Belastak. Um, and thanks for having us um, here with you. So a little bit of uh, Rotor. I'll, I'll jump right into the history of Rotor as uh, Sabir al already introduced me. Um, my name is Emmanuel Cortez uh, and uh, I've only been working with Rotor, Rotor for uh, the last four years, uh, but Rotor exists since 2005 or six, depending on uh, who's telling the story. Um, it started out as a as a series of research projects um, that were looking into the industrial waste flows. Um, and within the 10 years after that, it kind of developed into a more robust company, which now is Rotor and uh, Rotor DC. Um, so Rotor is a non-for-profit organization that started it all. Um, and uh, really quickly, there's uh, four main uh, channels of work that we do. So we, we are mainly interior designers or the projects that we are working in our interior design projects. Uh, we also do assistance to um, projects in, in architecture design deconstruction. We do exhibitions, lectures, uh, a lot of communications in the realm of, of reuse and reclaim uh, materials. Um, and we also do publications. Um, our last publication, uh, unfortunately, was only in French and Dutch, uh, but it's called uh, Deconstruction and reuse, and hopefully one day we'll ha we'll, we'll have uh, the moment to to be able to translate that into English. But I'll try to resume or uh, recap all of that uh, book into a short presentation for you. Um, finally, Rotor Rotor DC or, or Rotor Deconstruction is a spin-off uh, which I'll talk to you about first, as this spin-off kind of uh, helped us anchor ourselves in Brussels. Um, the spin-off really is a, a cooperative now, and it's a, it was a test to see if this kind of a cooperative could exist. And we're really happy that it has been existing for almost five years now, installed in the city of Brussels, which is very difficult with the amount of space that we need and all of the logistics that go uh, into reclaiming building materials um, around, around our, our region and our city. And so a little bit of the practicalities of what we do and how we, we started out this project. So Rotor, we used to, um, we used to seek out uh, buildings that were going to be demolished and try to intervene before that demolishing happened. So we would go in and um, with the expertise of the research we had done in the last 10 years, we would go in and um, identify materials that we knew we can uh, deconstruct, uninstall, if you will, um, very carefully. Here it may not look like it's very careful, but depending on what material you're, you're looking at, it will be more or less messy. Um, and so we like to take materials that were able to be reused in the same way that they were intended in their original uh, use or when they were first created. So here you see a team of, of uh, our colleagues working in, inside of buildings. Our focus is and has been uh, commercial buildings, office buildings, um, because we we noticed that there was a a lot of uh, antique reclaim projects that had already happened and existed for years. Um, I can share a link a little bit of the history of reuse that we have kind of compiled in this book that I spoke about earlier. Um, it is in English. It's on our website. Um, so I won't get into the details of the history of reuse, but we used we we have done reuse. Uh, since the beginning of time as human beings. And um, so, sorry, that was a little tangent, but we, our focus is on the commercial art, um, commercial and professional buildings that no one touches and no one reuses anymore. Um, there was a point in history where that kind of stopped uh, and it was in the early uh, 1900s where uh, skyscrapers became more and more popular and labor was a lot more expensive. And so we had to build quicker and reuse was no longer an option. So we're trying to go, come back to this um, practice of, of reclaiming materials that have a really, really short turnover. Uh, for example, partition walls or technical flooring or anything that really that goes into office buildings is what we what we look for and what we strive to uh, resell and, and reuse in 
specifically the Brussels region. Um, here we're inside of a, a historical um, metro station here in the north uh, part of Brussels. And so we're reclaiming um, these beautiful Carrara marble tiles that are on the walls, all on the floors. And we have over 400 square meters of each floor and uh, uh, wall tiles, tiles that, were, um, that were successfully reclaimed and undamaged. And so this is, it gives you an idea of the amount of work that goes into um, identifying and um, and learning about a material in order to dismantle it in a, in the, in a proper way without actually uh, damaging the material. Because our, like I said, and like I will repeat constantly, is that what we strive to do at Otto is put back into the market materials in the, the exact same kind of use that they were intended uh, when they were first made. Um, so that's what we call reclaim, reclamation, reuse. Um, when when a material is adapted or is changed, then we call that uh, upcycling. And when a material is uh, changed to a point where it no longer can be used at all to it in its original form, for example, uh, yeah, mixed gravel is a is a recycling um, system that is has been in place for a long, long time. And so we like to make the, the differentiation between these three things because we believe that there's a, a need to reuse and not confuse that with the other two. Um, uh, yeah, so like, like I said, uh, there's a lot of uh, logistics that we also uh, work in, and this is the part that Rotor de Se, the cooperative, uh, worked on. And I don't think that you can easily imagine, unless you're already working with reused materials, how, how much... Uh, of how much red tape is involved in reusing a material that was already uh, in a building before. So if you take a ladder from a building in, or for example, a partition wall like this that you're seeing on the screen from one building and you want to bring it to uh, a, sec a second building for another life, um, the actual uh, trajectory of that material is kind of, uh, it, it would make a zigzag all over town and it would create uh, a million phone calls and you would have to send it and ship it and you would have to stock it, re recondition it, um, maybe work it a little bit for it to be able to be uh, reused and, uh, properly. And what we strive to do at Rotor and uh, Rotor Deconstruction is to try and make that, that trajectory as smooth as possible with the least amount of um, uh, stakeholders possible. And that becomes very difficult uh, depending on the material, depending on where it's coming from, um, and also the mode of transport, and if there is storage wherever it needs to go, if the, I, there's a million things that can go wrong, um, and time is never on our side either. So that's another part of, of what we do is we try to manage materials to go into new constructions uh, in the right time and try to figure out and learn as we go. We learn a lot about materials, uh, and, and we believe that it's a very regional um, kind of learning that happens because we see a, a common set of categories of materials that we uh, run into in the Brussels region and the the region out, around Belgium as well. So um, that's something also to take into consideration. Um, like I said earlier, we are in the city of Brussels. So we are, we're a 20 minute walk from the center, from the downtown area. And so that gives you the an idea of the space that is needed uh, if we need to transport a truckload of partition walls like this from point A to point B and how difficult it is to find this kind of space in the city. So we like to uh, to think that we're very, very lucky uh, with the space that we have at the moment. It's an old chocolate factory, um, which is one of our, our main uh, attractions here in, um, in Brussels is the chocolate, I guess. Um, and there you have it. Here is a, it's, a, it's actually a, a reclaimed uh, road pavers that we, this is actually not us, this is a collaboration with uh, a reseller of these pavers that we like, like to highlight whenever we do projects or we kind of have a really strong connection with. Um, we also do research, uh, practical research, uh, to figure out what kind of materials we can actually um, reclaim that we didn't think we could before. So here is a picture of the, uh, well, the results of the cleaning process of toilets that came from a, a, a building in Brussels. Um, 
and you'll see the on the on the right side it's the let me let me rephrase we dumped them into a bat of acid to clean everything from the inside um, and we wanted to make sure that that didn't uh, that didn't decrease the porosity or that didn't uh, damage the porosity of the porcelain um, because if it did then it was unusable and so we did a few tests and we came up with a, a pretty good results with uh, cleaning sanitary components not just toilets but also urinals um, and sinks but unfortunately, this kind of a project uh, sometimes brings us to uh, not so positive uh, results. So we, we also look at the affordability of reusing and reselling, specifically in the cooperative side of Rotor. Uh, reselling these materials has to be affordable to us. Um, it has to be affordable to the buyer. And it has to, um, we have to keep in mind that there's labor behind it and there's, uh, there's a lot of, um, different processes that happen before we can actually resell the material. Um, we like to think that we can stay on, on a 30% margin from the market and, and sell be below that. Uh, but with labor and time, it goes, uh, it goes higher. So unfortunately, um, uh, toilets like this, we're, we are not gonna continue uh, cleaning, deep cleaning like this because it's just not, it's not worth it. And we have other materials that we can uh, facilitate our time or um, focus our time better with. Uh, moving on to the ISBEL, the non for profit part of Rotor, and I'll go a little bit quicker because I'm running out of time. Um, we do assistance to contractors and we do assistance to professionals, uh, other architects or designers. Um, and also, demolishing companies now are understanding the, the value in reclaiming uh, materials. And so they ask us to come in and assist them and make an audit of the building and of the materials inside the building that can actually, that have a potential for reuse. So we make a very precise uh, and uh, clear inventory of materials that can eventually be reused in a new, uh, in a new project. Um, this was a really, really huge project call for a cultural association here in Brussels called Zinica. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the whole project. I will only talk about a specific uh, facade on the inside courtyard. Um, and, and how we dealt with the flexibility that we needed in order to, re, to use um, reclaimed windows in this project. So we had to write the uh, call for, it was a public tender for materials that we needed to publish. Um, and writing this public tender became a little bit of a challenge and we figured out how to, how to make it adaptable enough so that we can have a window that's either as large as the, as an area that we propose or as small as our as a confined space uh, allowed for. Um, in these calls, we we have to precise any technical characteristics that are that um, must be um, met in order to to create to for the project to be legally uh, constructed and also our desires uh, as much as like the percentage of reclaimed materials that we want to put into it. So those things those things are not classical portions or sections of a of a public call but Rotor assists in doing so, uh, and we tried, we're trying to make that the norm, so it's, it's kind of difficult to do so. We also do prospecting uh, for specific uh, batches of materials. For example, in this project, there was these windows, um, and we finally found a winner for the call, which allowed us this much variety in uh, the different uh, categories of requirements that we needed to fulfill uh, this facade with. In the end, we um, came up with this facade, uh, and we thought it was very beautiful. And you can also see the the larger um, area where it's a uh, dotted line. That was that was the the largest window that we could uh, potentially reuse or, or implement into the structure. And here is the the uh, a picture of it in being being built. Um, so that kind of uh, gives me a little leeway in, uh, into the design that we do. We all, we do create uh, projects ourselves. We do intervene as archi as interior architects. Um, and with this project, I want to highlight just the fact that we we do work with uh, a, a network of people that are that either work with reused materials, resell uh, reused materials, or are just uh, they they want to be more incorporated into the circular economy. For example, here we worked with a woodworker that was very adaptive in in helping us create. I'm sorry, he was very creative in helping us adapt uh, these partition walls and glass doors on the left. 
Um, unfortunately, at the moment of dismantling these uh, partition walls, the accessories to reinstall them were either damaged or lost, or we didn't know that we should have taken them. So we're, as we learn on the job, uh, we have to uh, come up with um, with ways of fixing those issues that we're that we're learning. So we work with uh, woodworkers. We work with um, with all sorts of uh, people that have one way or another their foot in the circular economy here in Brussels. I'm going to skip through this because it's pretty much reiterating the the last project to talk about our uh, our museum project, which takes a different uh, view on on what we do. This is a contemporary art museum in Ostend here in Belgium, um, and they actually called to Rotor to help them uh, redesign their entire um, uh, permanent exhibition hall. And this was a very closed building. Uh, after after we intervened, we realized that it was it could be opened up. Uh, and so instead of reclaiming materials uh, 100%, what we did is just re-giving value to the existing structure. So we deconstructed the walls that were covering all of the windows on one side of the on the building, really opening up that space. Um, and we opened up a balcony that was closed off. Um, and we opened up all of the walls in the in the mess of the first uh, floor of this building to create a more open plan um, and highlight the, the original architecture of this beautiful building. Now, we did have a lot of uh, panels and wood from the old construction. Here you see more of that beautiful window that opened up. Um, and these materials that we extracted are not going to the to the to the bin, um, we we found ways to uh, to reuse this. So in another uh, exhibition, we created this little pavilion with the um, with the panels that we took from the museum. And so this is just a little bit of a little highlight of two design projects that differ, but also have reclaimed materials uh, in mind in one way or or another. Um, this is the view of the museum after we knocked down all the walls. Uh, you can also see the different colors in the carpet of where there used to be a wall. Um, so we that was part of the design and that, that stayed. So if you go to the museum today, you see on the floor the old uh, where the old walls were. Finally, we do um, uh, research. And we this is a project that we've been working for the last three years. Uh, actually, next week is the final event. I'm really excited to, to, um, to see the end of the first part of this project. And actually, uh, Bella Stock is one of our one of the eight partners that have uh, that have worked together uh, across uh, the north of France, uh, across uh, Belgium, part of uh, the UK and Ireland, and part of the the Netherlands as well. And so, what this project aims to to do in 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 the future is to um, increase the the circulation of reclaimed building materials, um, also increase the visibility of existing actors in the reclaim. Uh, reclaim building material um, sector in the construction sector. Uh, we've developed a lot of uh, deliverables and documents that you can actually download and they are free to use. Um, uh, yeah, in any of any construction, whether it's an extraction or a reinsertion of reclaim materials. Um, but these kinds of, of uh, documents are really difficult to uh, make in a very general sense. So these are mostly for the region that is highlighted here in this tiny little map. Uh, because legislation changes from country to country and um, even state to state, I guess in the states that can be a very different uh, ball game each time. So with that, I will leave you um, and I guess I can copy paste these into the chat later so you can follow us on our on our websites um, and also the end of this fun project. So I'll leave it to to Rusty you, up next. Yeah. Thank you, Manuel. I, yes, uh, we will be sharing the material that you've uh, given us. Um, I, I cannot not comment on um, your evolution, Roto's rev uh, evolution, and where you place yourself. You're the middleman, you're the, the researcher, you are developing standards, um, you're also, um, you know, doing particular modes of design, um, working with resellers, and this for the audience here, um, it's a collaborative, so you can imagine the range of expertise and backgrounds and interests 
that um, people who work for Roto or Roto DC bring. It's far wider than your typical, let's say, architectural. Um, and um, um, it's very, very interesting to hear it in the US, um, this kind of uh, operation. So with that, thanks, Emmanuel. And Rusty, do you want to take it away? Sure. Thanks, Saber. And, and I'll, I'll agree, uh, Emmanuel. It's, uh, I wish you guys were in West Alabama. I know we'd be able to do a lot of work together. So uh, thanks, thanks everybody. Hello, I am um, Rusty Smith with Auburn University's um, Rural Studio, and I'm delighted to share a little bit of our work relative to material reuse. Rural Studio is a design build program uh, where architecture students spend anywhere from one semester to as many of, as two years of their five years of undergraduate education. And as a design build program, Rural Studio was founded around a handful of really simple premises. The first uh, is we embrace the idea that the best way to learn how to do something is by actually doing it. The second is that we found that when faced with uh, trying to tackle really difficult problems, it's always best to tackle them together. And finally, and perhaps more importantly, we believe that everyone, no matter their circumstance, deserves a safe, durable, healthy, and dignified place to call home. Rural Studio is located in Hale County, Alabama, um, which is about three hours west of Auburn's main campus. This is where we work in downtown New Bern, Alabama, which has a population of about 186 people. And this is what we call the Super Shed, which is a large covered structure designed and built by students where they live and work uh, while studying with us in Hale County. The Super Shed itself is constructed from a recycled railroad trestle, a railroad bridge, and then you can see nestled underneath it, uh, you see these small pods where our students live. Designed and built by students throughout the years, the pods themselves are all various experiments in material reuse and assembly. Here you'll see just one of the pods, uh, which was constructed from really large 1,500-pound bales of wax-impregnated cardboard. That's a cast-off from the manufacturer of shipping boxes for catfish, which is one of our important local agricultural crops. And in this image, you see Shepard and Alberta Bryant's house in the background, which was the first project that was designed and built by Rural Studio students almost 30 years ago. A lot like the cardboard pod, this project is also constructed of bales, but in this case, bales of locally harvested hay. This idea of thinking about what operations can be logically performed on, by, and with materials like bailing, stacking, bundling, cutting, bending, breaking, rolling, hanging, stretching, scoring, and on and on and on and on and on, this is really a key component of our work. So I hope that this operational method is clear in the work itself. And rather than focusing on that piece of it, I thought it might be more useful to frame the following projects through both the matter and method from which the projects are derived. And for this purpose of the discussion, I'll consider those to be uh, materials, things, objects, buildings, and ultimately time. So our students first come to us like architecture students might from anywhere. When they join us on the ground in Hill County, one of the first activities in which they engage is what we call neck down work, in which the students are tasked with some type of team oriented labor. In this case, they spend a few days dismantling a donated barn and also organize and categorize the wood for possible later reuse. Our students in all of their projects work directly with real clients on real projects, with real sites, with real schedules and real budgets, and hopefully with real long-term positive impacts on the lives of our neighbors. And here you'll see a group of our students meeting with Rosalie Turner, who was living in a house that was literally falling down around her. In this meeting, the students are talking with Rosalie and learning what she might need in a new home. So in addition to clients, the students also work with all sorts of other folks, including community stakeholders and professional consultants, such as structural and environmental engineers, healthcare professionals, economists, and social scientists. And through this process, the students learn everything they need to know about both the design and, and how to build their proposed project. And then, of course, then they get to building it. Here you see a, students, a group of students working in a fairly common practice that we utilize. They're working to provide a replacement home for Rose Lee. This idea is pretty simple. You keep Rose Lee sheltered in place in the original home, and you build a new home directly adjacent. Then once the new home is finished and Rose Lee moves in, the students will then demolish the original home. And here you see the house moving quickly through construction, and then the interior of the home the day Rose Lee moved in. And in this case, all of the wood and brick you see in the interior of Rosalie's house were, was, were repurposed from the barn you saw the students taking down earlier. 
And of course, here you see the house finished, all clad in local cedar that was harvested, milled, and assembled also by the students. In addition to single family houses, our students can take on much larger and ambitious projects like this, where four students were tasked to design and build a firehouse for the town of Newburn. This provides not only the first building constructed in Newburn in over 110 years, but it also brings emergency first response and fire protection to a community that previously had none. Like Rose Lee's house, the firehouse is also built from two salvaged barns. And of course, the students who conceived and built this structure totally understood the irony of building a firehouse completely out of wood. Over the years, our students have designed and built many structures out of what might be otherwise considered trash or refuse. Whether it's a chapel constructed completely from discarded car tires and salvaged corrugated tin, or a house built solidly out of over 70,000 stacked carpet tiles in Mason's Bend, Alabama. Or here, a local community meeting hall partly clad in car window glass salvaged from a junkyard. And even here, a local Little League baseball field where spectators are protected by a backstop, which is constructed from catfish nets that have otherwise met the end of their useful life. All of these projects share the common theme of once useful objects that through time and use have become useless things, but have returned to life as useful objects once again through design. The philosopher Clement of Alexandria once wrote, goods are called good because they can be used for good. And for us, this type of positive utility that can transform an otherwise useless thing back into an object of desire. So a number of years ago, we received a call from a manufacturer that said they had heard of our interest in reusing useless things. And they said they had access to thousands of galvanized 55-gallon uh, steel drums if we wanted them. So we asked if they'd send some pictures of them, which they did, and we thought that they were beautiful. We then asked if they could send us some, and they did that also, 300 to a truckload. And here you can see us unloading that very first truck. Now, incidentally, these are called mint oil barrels, which when full have a value of about $30,000. But once all the mint oil is used in flavoring toothpaste, gum, and breath mints, the barrels have no value and can't be reused. So when the barrels first arrived, the students naturally did what architecture students naturally do. They organized them and they stacked them into walls. And periodically over the next year, they arranged and rearranged and rearranged them again into rooms and mazes. And once they learned everything that they could possibly be done with these barrels, these three students took on using the barrels to design and build a one-of-a-kind playground for the children of Greensboro. So they taught themselves to weld and began building a playground in Lions Park. And 3,000 barrels and 24,000 welds later, this is what the children of Greensboro received, which you can see is extraordinarily beautiful and it's artful. And it's also a really fantastic place to play. And on special occasions, it can even act as a remarkable musical instrument as well. We've since gone on to utilize the mint oil barrels for a variety of other projects, including our own greenhouse that was designed and built by students to extend the growing season on our own farm. Here you see the interior of the greenhouse where the barrels not only act as the supporting structure for the south facing glass, but also as a trim wall, which helps keep the plants warm during our cool winter nights. Our students work with found objects of all sizes and some of them are really quite large. For instance, these four students were trained and certified as tower erectors. And then they were tasked with dismantling an abandoned 100 foot tall fire tower located 50 miles from Newburn. And then, working with the Audubon Society, the students re-erected the tower on the edge of a beautiful Oxbow Lake amongst the backwaters of the Cahaba River, where it acts as a bird watching facility in one of the uh, major migratory flyways in North America. It also offers spectacular views over the adjacent Cypress Lake, as well as to the landscape beyond, whether you like bird watching or not. So reusable materials are found all around us, and we often utilize what we find right from the land itself. In Alabama, for example, two by fours and telephone poles are our largest single agricultural crop. Or in other words, we grow a lot of pine trees in Alabama. A byproduct of commercial tree farming is what is referred to as forest thinnings, where the selective removal of underperforming trees is utilized to enhance the optimal growth of other more desirable trees. 
These thinnings are for the most part unusable and have no value and are often either burned on site or sold off as pulp for $3 per ton. Of course, this is what thinnings looks like in action, where you see the performing trees are stripped of their lower limbs and the smaller underperforming roundwood logs are cut and stacked to the side. So these four st students were working with the local Boy Scouts to design and build a scout hut for troop meetings. A local troop was currently holding their meetings in a small nondescript metal building. And the scouts confided with the student team that what they really wanted was a log cabin, like all of the other Boy Scout troops in the region. So the students visited these other troops and they learned that what they actually had was simply the same nondescript metal buildings, but they just had split logs adhered to the front face of the building to make them look like log cabins. So our st student team uh, set off to design and build an actual log cabin that was fully functional in every way. The trouble was, however, they were tasked with using cast off round wood as their building material, which was way too variable in size and dimension to utilize in a traditional stacked log system. So learning from their structures courses back on campus, the students remembered that buildings don't necessarily fall down because of gravity, but rather the most significant forces on their structure would actually come from uplift and lateral loads caused by wind. So rather than trying to stack the irregular shaped round wood as you might in a traditional log building, instead the students designed and erected a series of structural bents, which act as sort of saddlebags for the building. And by then bundling the round wood logs together inside these bents, the weight of the logs served to hold the building down rather than up. And of course, being architecture students, they then had to pick the building completely up off the ground just so you could see what was really going on. Of course, today, all of our talk is about carbon. Every conference, webinar, seminar, and class we attend is carbon, 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 and rightly so, so I'm gonna talk about it a little bit here as well. As we build buildings with lower and lower operational energy loads, a higher and higher percentage of our carbon impact comes from our material specification and procurement methods. And by 2050, it's estimated that this embodied carbon will be responsible for almost half of the total new construction emissions between now and then. So following this logic, it seems that the greenest building we can imagine is the one that's already built. And at Rural Studio, we reuse a lot of buildings, like this burned out school building in Marion, Alabama, which was reappointed as an after-school resource learning center for both students and teachers alike. Or this, a century old and abandoned bank building in New Bern, Alabama, renovated to act as a local lending library which now provides not only access to books, but also brings access to high-speed internet to the town of Newburn for the very first time. And finally, in these uh, last few minutes that I have, I thought it'd be useful to share just a few of our many exhibition installations to which we get invited from time to time. In the Milan Triennale, for example, we worked with a local recycler to temporarily borrow or side cycle one day's paper intake to fill the exhibit hall. And with this material, we constructed a series of rooms, some rooms for reflection and other rooms for performance. A few years ago, we also per, uh, participated in the Venice Biennale, where curator Alejandro Aravena made a dramatic and impactful statement by filling the grand entrance hall to the Arsenal with over 100 tons of construction waste salvaged from the previous Biennale. For our own installation in the Arsenal, we worked with a local homeless shelter in Venice to compile a list of all the items that they needed but couldn't afford for their clients, which included bed frames, storage lockers, panel partitions for privacy and the like. And then we, then we used the entirety of the provided exhibition budget to purchase these items and use them all as temporary materials for the design and construction in our own installation. So here you can see the lockers stacked to the left, creating an entry corridor to a theater room to the right which is composed of still wrapped bed frames that are double hung from the ceiling to create a transparent enclosure. Inside the enclosure, guests can sit on benches which are made for some of the stacked privacy partitions while other partitions float overhead to help control the sound from various rural studio short films on display inside. And once the Biennale was over, all of the supplies were dismounted, stacked and loaded on a barge and then shipped down the Grand Canal to our shelter partner. In the end, the only thing that we had that went unused was this small tangled nest of zip ties that you see to the right. So to finish up, it's important for us to say that this notion of materials in flux, in motion through space and time, 
is of vital importance to our work. We're always wondering not what we will use something for, but what will it be used for next? This is an ever more important question in our work. So in this image, we see a house just passing through. And this installation at the Birmingham Museum of Art, which is comprised solely of the framing package from one of our small houses, we simply a home pause momentarily in transit. And of course, that installation later did become a house for one of our clients. But again, if we did our job and we did it well, the materials in this house are only paused momentarily and in transit to their next becoming. So to date, Rural Studio has educated over 1,200 citizen architects, and they've designed and built over 200 projects in our own service area. The work I've shared today represents just 16 of those projects designed and constructed by 156 of our students. Both myself and those students would like to thank you for your interest, and we look forward to the following conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Rusty. Um, you know, every time one sees you, uh, the work of Rural Studio all the way from the early days with Sam Mugby and then you and Andrew Frears, I'm just, it's in, it's insane the degrees, the different kinds of discourses that you guys balance. <laughs> the pedagogy of full scale detailing drawn on in Newburn, in your studios there, to you know, conversing with the with the folks at uh, the Biennale at Aravena or the Milan Triennale, and then of course, ultimately the most important people, um, the folks that you're building houses for in um, in Newburn. So this this discourse that you guys, the the range of discourse that you guys cover is is incredibly impressive. Um, we're going to open it up to a conversation between the four of you, uh, four of us, and I. Particularly, and I'm interested in in each of you commenting on the work of the other three or other two practices. So, um, Emmanuel, Antoine, do you want to join Rusty? Thanks. Yes. So, I'm going to ask you to do the work of responding uh, through examples of your own, um, but also perhaps transiting through the other two. And I have, uh, I'm keeping an eye on the time. I had a series of um, more focused questions simply because your uh, practices covers the gamut, such a range. The first had to do with material and territory. Because all of you deal with material and I was interested in how it, the relationship between material and territory in your practices. Location of sources, uses, distance between them, um, uh, territorial networks. So if you, each of you could perhaps speak about it. The next one will be about the relationship between material and labor, the relative value and valorization of, of each. So let's take uh, material and territory for a moment, and then material and labor. I, I, I can jump in really quickly, I guess, Saber, and, and, and start with um, yeah. material and territory. So, so um, you know, Rural Studio, we're, we consider ourselves to be, um, you know, very place-based and, and, and fiercely local, we, we like to say. We've got a really small operational footprint. We can uh, work with about 20, within about 25 miles of, of Newburn. So we've got about a four or five county service area. Um, and we're working in a place uh, that's considered to be persistently impoverished. So, um, you know, you sort of put those two things together and it affects a lot of our decisions about about materials and sources. So, you know, a lot of a lot of folks ask, um, you know, what's the, what's the number one thing you need to do in these places that are really, you know, kind of underserved? And and of course, there's a there's a million and one things we need to do. But if I had to say just one is that there's very, very few resources and resources and very few dollars in these places. And the number one thing you can do is keep those resources and those those dollars there because they typically leave these places and go everywhere. We get we get food, housing, education, health care. Everything comes from someplace else and not much stuff gets put back. So keeping those resources local are extraordinarily important. Um, and so we try to look down at our feet uh, right around us and, you know, sort of find the things um uh, in, in which we're working. When, when we do have occasions to work, and it's mostly through some of the exhibit work and things like that, 
again, we also try to work really locally. It was real, like when we were in Venice, for example, it was really important that we worked with local folks with local know-how and, and local needs and to, and to, um, you know, really respond to that dramatic, really dramatic uh, um, statement that Aravina made with, you know, what goes in normally to exhibits like that um, and what gets thrown away uh, at, at the end. So um, where materials come from is important and the fact that they come locally is even more important for us. Thank you. I had a question actually, Rusty, for the, for the Venice uh, Biennale, all the materials that you purchased were coming, they, mm -hmm. they were purchased locally and there were also reclaimed materials that then you reuse again? I, I didn't quite. They were, they were all, yeah, so they were all brand new. So, you know, so, okay. so typically, you know, you get a little, bud, you get a little budget at, at these right. sorts of things to build. And so we, rather than buy construction materials, we worked right. with um, a couple of local shelters there to see what they needed. And we just bought what they needed and said, okay, that's our material palette that we're going to work for and just pause them temporarily in the arsenal. And the goal was to, was to not use, you know, to, to not discard anything. And, and it literally, right. that moment in the end, when we had that little bundle of zip ties at the end, which was about, literally about that big, was, that's when we knew we had, we'd kind of made it. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, sometimes you do run into a wall where you can't really, I mean, you have no other option but to buy new. Um, but yeah, okay. I thought that was really interesting how how you managed to f figure out kind of like reverse engineer the the process by which these materials will go into uh, a second life. Um, but yeah, I can also jump in into the territory and the material and versus the territory and like rural studio studio. We also kind of aim to uh, act as local as possible. Um, because of the environmental impact, but I guess it, it really depends on the material uh, and how much that impact uh, is, right? So if if we go all the way to France to get some parquet, some uh, wood flooring, uh, to us it's still in the region of Europe and it still works and it's still okay. But if we're gonna be selling to Australia, that's a, that's a no-go for us. We cannot be uh, <laughs> sending material that far away when we can actually just um, contact them and ask them, hey, I'm pretty sure there are some actors in your area that are doing what we're doing. Maybe we can help you find them, but we, I mean, we, we've decided to stop selling to anywhere outside of Europe. I mean, and, and I'm talking strictly in the, uh, on the side of the cooperative, um, which, which does a lot of business and a lot of, uh, yeah, like cutting corners to make sure that everything goes uh, in a positive, positive way. Um, yeah. Antoine. Yeah, uh, Sabir, when you, when you ask the, the question of the territory, it's it's really important for Belastok. I wanted to to show it during the presentation. My English is quite difficult to explain some economic aspect, but for example, I, I just want to explain a project that we did in north of Paris in an agglomeration. So it's Tix City, and they ask us to make a diagnostic. Uh, the project is calling Urban Metabolism. And uh, we analyzed 30 sites of demolition in that agglomeration. And the game was to understand uh, how to transform that material in that agglomeration. Do we have um, the filière, the people who can transform the, mater the material and to introdu introduce it in, in the new project? Then we fixed uh, 10 new projects on that agglomeration and we did a kind of game between all the, the different stakes, the people who collect, the people who transform, and the one who will introduce that project in in the new buildings. And for us, it's it's a way to to, to keep the resource on the territory and to, to develop economically and to make the um, actors growing uh, about knowledge uh, about reusing material. I don't know if I'm clear because my, my English is, is quite rigorous, but uh, the territory can be developed through the circulation of the material, like Rusty was explaining. Uh, we share a lot that uh, philosophy. Yeah, and actually, um, you were in in the first in, in the last project that you were talking about. Um, it was precisely that that the recirculating of the material was giving economic opportunity to to the local. 
Um, yeah. What about labor? I mean, it's very, very clear that the students at um, Rural Studio love, um, you know, learning new skills and actually practicing, uh, um, developing their talents. I was particularly taken with um, with the early years of Bella Stock and how quickly it went from 2006 to to where you are now. I mean, it's a significant play um, with the number of sectors. And I'm wondering if um, um, you could speak to that and possibly um, Emmanuel a little bit, because while you guys are in a way, Emmanuel, very carefully uh, take deconstructing the material and perhaps curating it as you write standards and so on, um, there has to be a sense of, um, of an appreciation of labor that uh, perhaps you could draw uh, attention to. Antoine? Yeah, yeah. I have two, two aspects in that, in, uh, for that question. The first, yes, of course, to, to be on the field and to build by ourselves, we developed a kind of respect of the resource, respect of the territory and respect of the matter. Um, and, and of course, after 16 years of uh, doing by ourselves, I think we, we have a consideration for the mat matter we use in our project. That's the, the first aspect. Even uh, an ecological philosophy now through all our, our project. So it connects, uh, it connects a lot with, with the, the territory, the, the material you use. But if I take the last project I present you, the, the three people we employed, uh, they normally uh, uh, work in gardening in the district. And we tell them, do you want to learn how to make dry stone uh, assemble? And I saw that even if the work was hard, because uh, stone is not easy, they, they were really uh, satisfied by, by the work they did because each element is different. The goal is to, to do something which is not industrial, but which is where you can put some, um, where you can put your design, you can do by, by yourself in a way. So they, they, they felt like, um, Santi accomplish. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can use that word. So the labor of reusing, in a way, is you, you feel better, you feel good after uh, after building with some element that you transform and after that you collect. So that the two aspects I, I wanted to explain, Sabia. Thank you. Um, I was watching, rewatching. Uh, we had Bast here, uh, Bureau d'Architecture Santif. Uh, from Toulouse two years ago for a um, short um, residency. And um, this was a talk where they were talking about precisely, um, you tell the concrete wall uh, uh, craftsman, mason, um, that his wall will not be plastered over, that his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his craft will be seen. And immediately um, they become partners in this. Um, Emmanuel, the question about um, labor in in Rotor. Yeah, um, I think it's a it's one of our. I, I guess we, we we like to think that we create jobs and we create a, a new labor economy. Um, if you think about demolished buildings and and the process by which they go through, it's uh, usually machines and usually one person uh, manning a, a machine that will do the job of I don't know anywhere from five to fifteen uh, people dismantling the same building or the same part of the building, if you will. Um, and on top of that, it's not only the moment of, of dismantling, but it's also the moment of transporting these uh, materials, of learning how to actually manage these materials and recondition them. Uh, learning how to store them even is is kind of become a thing that we've been specialized in at Votor. When I started at Votor, it was a team of four or five managing a, a huge store and a huge warehouse. And us four, we, we, we started restructuring uh, this cooperative to make it function a little bit more smoothly, which was really difficult. But I tell you, at, at today, there's maybe 17, up to 23 uh, employees, or maybe 17 full-time uh, uh, equivalents, and then a, a few interns. And it's, it's amazing how much work goes into the reclamation of, of materials and uh, also in the last five years or, or, or more, we've, we started to see other uh, um, 
other companies kind of rise and, and start doing more specialized work. So Rotor is very general, as I, as I described. It's really difficult to describe what we do because uh, we, <laughs> we, we're kind of very, we do very sporadic uh, research and we try to see what, what works and what doesn't. And we try to set an example of what actually can work. And, and we've started to see uh, that work pay off because like I said, there's a social enterprise I have uh, started who do dismantling and reinsertion of, of social, of, uh, of reinsertion to the labor, uh, this kind of social enterprise. Uh, through yeah. the careful dismantling of materials, which is really you know, great. there is just so much, and I'm sure each of you is aware of what the spin-offs are, how it goes out into various communities um, that you might not even have originally planned. Uh, Emmanuel has not mentioned that uh, Rotor has um, a terrific website. They've looked at everything on how to organize material flows, and it's called Opalis. O P A L I S, and of course, um, the wit there is that it's the acronym for spolia. Spolia being the waste material from millennia from Rome on. Um, <clears throat> I, I, just segueing quickly to the to how these things go into the various communities. Um, Rusty, the the work that your students do and the skills that they learn and the um, amenities that they provide to part of Alabama, uh, well, all over the South, but especially Alabama, that has always been um, forgotten. I'm wondering whether those skills and, and things that they learn actually spill over to the communities themselves. For instance, workshops with uh, DIY workshops or folks who are just simply doing Motel 6 construction can actually then become part of the downstream of rural studio. Yeah, uh, so so they do, they do a little, Saber, but the uh, and there, there's a lot of ways that that that, that kind of question gets asked. Um, so we work really closely with our community members, our elected officials, our stakeholders, and those sorts of things. We we don't invent any any projects. We it's one of the many lessons we've learned over 30 years is you don't come into a community and invent a project. The, this this projects have to come from the community. Um, and there's, so there's a there's a lot of community engagement in the in the design work of the projects and the development work of the projects. Um, uh, there's a little bit in in the kind of the skills of constructing a project, but not as much as you might think or or might hope would be available. And and you know sort of very often you know just the kind of pragmatics of it. If you think about a lot of our um, families that we provide homes for, they're often elderly. Uh, uh, you know, may not be ambulatory, have a lot of health sort of challenges, uh, could be a working mother who has three jobs and sort of the last thing that, you know, is on her sort of um, need to learn how to do is uh, how to cut two by fours and put them together into wall assemblies. So we're sort of really clear about, uh, you know, those kinds of expectations of, of, of contribution to the work. Uh, you know, the we, we do work in what we call a mutual aid model where the real labor that our clients provide to our students is the act of being a client. Um, that's an extraordinarily labor uh, intensive and it's an extraordinary mm -hmm. gift, you know, particularly when you're working with young people learning how to be architects. That's really the labor that, that they're involved with. Now we we do we do work around the southeast through the front porch initiative where we're where we do offer our housing products designs and technical assistance to build those projects to partners uh, that whether they're um, workforce development uh, partners or or just housing developers um, we do offer those services where and those folks are intensely involved in the actual labor of the projects. Um, there's a there's a question that perhaps I mean I, we could, the the social worlds of your material practices are very very clear as they emerge out of originally you know working just with material. I had a question for the students and for the architects and the designers. Um, Cloud Levy Strauss in his in his very early essay called The Science of the Concrete. Um, identifies for us two paradigms. He calls it the paradigm of the engineer and the paradigm of the bricoleur, um, the bricklayer, the mason, the person who puts things together from whatever's at hand. And what's remarkable about all three of you at different moments 
you employ or have to employ the mindset of the engineer, the rational standardizer, and so on. And at the same time, the hand is still present when you are in front of whatever the assembly, this the the pile of materials that then you've drawn to actually put together the the kind of the bricolage as well as the engineering or the rational and. It was particularly clear in Bella Stock's beginning to where they are now. And I'm curious whether you could speak to how both of those vantages or points of view are present in where you work and that they move perhaps to change emphases in one project to another or over the years. But the, the fact that there is the rational as well as the artisanal. Um, yes, Abhi. We start like. Uh, by by building by ourselves a lot, but in you know we started in 2006. In 2012, uh, uh, a girl from Belastok, Julie Benoit, starts a research for for um, environmental um, a gov government um, environmental government organization, and they ask us to um, make kind of theory about what we did. And to make some tools to share with our um, friends, or not friends, with all the architects from French architects, to help them to deconstruct better than demolish some building. And I think it was the moment she asked us to take a step back from the bricolage and to try to explain what was the different step, how it works, and how we can um, multiply, uh, multiply it. No. Uh, how we can reorganize and to and how we can repeat this this type of process for others and when you when you have to make some pedagogy and research and explain how you did that's the moment you 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 go out from the bricolage and you have to find a kind of strategy and to explain it the better you can so others actors can work with it so i think it's it's the moment where belastok um, step from bricolage to engineering. Thank you. That was a great answer. I'd love to see that study. Um, we are um, sort of in the final stretch. There were a couple of questions that were very specific. Um, one was for um, Rural Studio about how the heck do you get licenses and permits for the students who work on your projects. And I, and she asked that question just as uh, Rusty, you were talking about how you trained and certified four students to take down electric towers. So I said, there's your answer. But perhaps you could type something into the Q&A. And, um, <clears throat> you know, the other question was for uh, Otto, um, what are the more typical uh, materials that you deconstruct and are able to perhaps reuse? And what are the most untypical ones um, that um, have come across uh, the practice here? So um, there are, oh, there's one more new question. Let's see what's come up um, unanswered. Actually, that's okay. So it's following up on Saber's question on labor. What do the speakers think about the role of automation in augmenting human labor using reclaimed materials. <laughs> oh, Benjamin. Um, and, the, and are there times where you wish a robot could help with repetitive surveying construction tasks or a custom computer program could manage materials? Yeah, I think that's the gauntlet thrown for all three of you. What would happen if there were a robot in uh, New Bern or in Anderlicht or in, um, in Paris? That should not be the question we end with, but just have a quick yeah. response. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll say quickly, we use robots a lot uh, in, in some of our fabrication uh, the techniques, just like any, any kind of contemporary architect would. Uh, so for instance, all of, all of the, uh, in the library that I showed, for example, uh, a tremendous amount of, of plywood uh, went into that project and it was all robotically, um, you know, digitally manu cut, not manufactured using, you know, CNC routers and things like that. I mean, I think the, the larger question relative to labor, um, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's, go it's going to take all kinds um, to sort of solve some of the problems that, that we're dealing with. 
Um, you know, a lot of there's a lot of conversation in housing manufacturing, for for example, how housing procurement, whether site built construction or 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 uh, mass production, fa uh, factory built homes, uh, modular housing, 3D printed houses, all of those sorts of things. And folks want to know what's the right answer. What's the right answer relative to all of these different technologies? You know, one of our sponsors, Fannie Mae, has shared with us that the the housing inventory crisis in the U.S. is about a four trillion dollar problem. Meaning that if we had $4 trillion, we could just sort of buy that housing problem and make it go away. And that tells me that it's going to take all of these things. It's going to take a lot of robots and it's going to take a lot of hands by human beings uh, working together to uh, solve some of these really sort of intrinsic challenges that the, the we're, we're facing today. Thank you. Um, if I may. Um, yeah. I think I think if there was a if there were robots, I, if, I, it it takes a lot to teach a robot to do the work of a human being. Um, and if we can teach a robot to design for reclamation, to design for deconstruction, then sure, let's do it. But um, I mean, there there are some uh, yeah, systems that are being developed currently for drones to go into buildings and do inventories with uh, by scanning, and um, you get a lot of uh, uh, you, you get to build a da database without like 15 men or women going into a building and manually writing all of these things down. But um, at the end of the day, there are a lot of hidden gems in buildings that need to be rescued, if you will. Um, and so I, I don't, I don't think it's possible to do the. I mean, I feel like re reuse is a is an artisanal craft to to some extent. And I would love to visit your storeroom and uh, in Brussels and elsewhere and wonder how it compares to our Home Depots. Um, oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, Antoine, do you have a, a thing? Otherwise, I just want to thank all of you. You have a final comment? Uh, no, no. I just want to thank, thank you for inviting us. And well, um, thank, you. You all. thank you. Thank you. And um, this has been fantastic. And I especially want to thank someone who is no longer in Atlanta, uh, who get us got this thing going. Uh, where I was working with Pascal Bayard, who is a previous cultural attaché, and um, you know pitched pitched Bella Stock and Rotor, and then with that um, came a Rural Studio. But she was she was integral in getting. Uh, connections with Bella Stock and Rotor. So, uh, Rusty, Emmanuel, Antoine, thank you so much. I will, of course, be in touch. And once again, fantastic afternoon. And we're bringing it right close at 2 p.m. so that folks of you in Brussels and um, Paris can actually now go out and get an aperitif. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank bye, you. Rusty. Bye, Emmanuel. Bye, Antoine. Thanks, Saber. Bye-bye.